There we go. Gonna let Warren in here. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Kyle AA0Z. I'm uh, hosting this. I am by no means an expert in Node-RED. Um, Alan is not able to, I don't know, W, uh, what's Alan's call sign? WB0 or WB2, maybe WB2. Um, forgot Alan's call sign. He's a little under the weather. WA9UD. WA9, yeah, he's a nine call. Yeah, UD. Because he's in Michigan, right? I think. He's in Indiana. Oh, he's in Indiana. Oh, yeah, Michigan's eight, right? Um, yeah. And then uh, Dave is supposed to join. He said he was going to join. He is the, those two guys are really the experts. They, the, the stuff that they are doing is, is amazing. Um, but let me share my screen here and let's just kind of go over um, screen number one. So let me share my screen. So does everyone see my screen here? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. let's start out with the, the, the basics. So this is this is your, your control panel or your um, where you where you put your flows. If you if you um, many of you are probably um, node red um, rasp. If you want if you want to get started, what I would suggest is getting a Raspberry Pi. For $35, $40, you can get the, the least expensive one, get a power supply, make sure that you, you get a, a, a power supply that, uh, that's USB-C because the new uh, US or the new Pi 4s are USB-C. And um, if you have any, any um, IT skills, um, you should be able to get that up and, and running pretty quickly. If not, uh, what you basically do is, is there are plenty of, plenty of videos out there on YouTube on how to get a Raspberry Pi, a headless Raspberry Pi up and running. Um, Raspberry actually has, if you go to, I believe it's the Raspberry Pi homepage, I think that Pi image, uh, let's see, I think if you go to raspberrypi.org, you can download this imager and it will literally ask you what is your wireless credentials what's your wireless ssid or if you want um if you want to uh, put it on the network if you want to give it a static ip i think that is all built into this imager so you get an sd card that's probably you know eight or 16 gig is probably the the, the least you can get and i would get a decent one. I'd get one that is probably, you know, 10 or 15 bucks. It's a, it's a sand disc. It's um, it's a, it's a good brand name because you're going to do a, doing a lot of writing, reading and writing to, to the, uh, the, 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 the image. So after you download the raspberry Pi image and you image it, you'll stick it in the back of the pie, boot the pie up and, um, it all depends on if you choose if you want to install the, the operating system or if you want to go headless. If you want to, or um, if you don't want to install the, the operating system, if you don't up, if you don't install the operating system, um, you can boot it up on on a monitor and it will uh, pop up with a, a command line. You log in with Pi, just the username. The password is Raspberry is the default. All lowercase and it'll get you into the um uh that pi user once you do that then um you probably need to do some updates and again youtube videos are are the place to go to to figure out how to update your raspberry pi it's very simple it's like two commands app get or sudo app get update and uh sudo app get um upgrade will get you the updates you need then you come over here to the Raspberry Pi Node Red page, and uh, I saw Dave pop on there. Hello, Dave. And you want to copy and paste this line: bash curl sl https, and type that in. 
Once you type that in, it's going to go through the checks. It's going to load Node.js. It's going to load Node-RED 2.0. And it's going to basically ask you, do you want to start Node-RED? And after it gets done loading, you can run the, um, it's on the screen. It'll show you on the screen how to start Node-RED and how to start Node-RED as a service. So when you reboot the Raspberry Pi, it comes up as a service and you don't have to manually start it every single time. That's probably, if you want it dedicated, it's probably one of the easiest ways to get Node-RED running on your network with a dedicated device that is low cost. And that's, that's what I've done uh, on my network. After that boots up and installs correctly, you want to point your computer to 192.168.1. You know, let's say it gets an address of 100. So you'll point your, your computer to 192.168.1.100 colon 1880. And you should come up with a page that looks like this. This is your palette or this is your, your, um, um, your workspace that you're gonna create your own flows. So real quick, you've got your, your nodes over here on the left-hand side. You've got your, your flows here in the middle, and then you've got some tabs up here that do different things. For example, let's create our first flow. So we're gonna in inject a timestamp. And then let's just, for lack of a better um, flow here, we're going to bring over a debug node, okay? So you wire these things together and now they're connected. To deploy them, you come over here and hit the deploy button over here in red. So there's a couple of ways you can deploy. You can deploy full, the modified nodes, uh, or the modified flows, the modified nodes. And this is a new one, restart flows in 2.0. I've had trouble in the past with these two, the modified flows and the modified nodes, because if you get a lot of, of flows going, sometimes it gums up and I've had to restart node red. So I just choose the full. So after I hit the deploy button, it's going to say successfully deployed. Now, if I come over here to one of my tabs, that is the debug plane sidebar, you can see that there's nothing over here. But whenever I inject the timestamp by hitting this button, see how it turns? I'm going to click it. It's going to give me the timestamp. And I think that is... Um, uh, Unix, time. Unix, yeah, Unix time timestamp. Which is a date between some now and sometime in 1970, if I remember. Yeah, correct. Yep. Um, there's different, um, you know, you can come in here and add different uh, nodes. And the way that you do that is you've come up here to the hamburger me menu up in the upper right hand corner and click it, you get a whole slew of stuff. If you come down here to manage palette and click on that, here is where you come over to install or click on palette, click on install. And this is where you can search for different nodes that you can install. So let's just, let's just, uh, search on time. So there's a whole ton of time-based nodes that you can load. I have got one that's already loaded. Um, where is it? Uh, I can't find it. Well, let's go with, um, I was going to go with this time range, but that's too complex. Um, let's just go with the unit converter. 
So if I stick that in the middle here and I double click on it, it's going to give me different parameters that I can choose. So let's go down here to time. So the category is time. The input is, I don't know if this is gonna work to tell you the truth because the input is not um, Unix time form. But you can see how this is this this is working, right? So if you had a input of a minute and you wanted to convert it to nanoseconds, so your input would be message payload. So that would be your minutes here. And your output would be, again, it would rewrite message payload to nanoseconds. And it would, you can round to the nearest decimal, you'd hit done. And as soon as message input or um, um, message payload came into unit converter as a minute, it would convert it to, to nanoseconds and shoot it out to this debug node. So any node that you think is not created, I bet you if, you if you search hard enough, there's a node that does something that you you wanted to do. I was, um, for example, I was trying to find a node that took some some um, um, differences and you feed it in an array. So I was going to feed it two arrays and I wanted to know the difference between, I got you, Dave. Um, oh, no, I don't have you. All right. Can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. You were just uh, quiet there. Yeah, I just have to bring up the level a little bit. Yeah. So I, I was wanting to, to pass two arrays to this node here and you give it a left input as an array. I, I gave it a message left and you give it a right input as, as message right. And then you can do the complement, the intersection or the union between you know, two payloads, two, two arrays, two whatever. And I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna have to write a function to do this. And I got to, to look in and somebody already wrote a node to do it. So I, was, uh, I didn't have to write, write anything fancy. Hey, Kyle, I think for tonight, maybe we should just cover some of the basics to get guys going. Well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm just kind of yeah. I'm just kind of showing some some basic yeah. stuff here. Like on the timestamp, show them how you can change it instead of sending a timestamp. Yep. You can yep. send a string or something. Yep. So here on the timestamp. You can you've got different ways that you can um, inject different stuff. So here you can inject a string. So let's say we inject uh, AA0Z, right? So then click done and wire these two together and click deploy. And there's my string, AA0Z. You can, uh, a number, a Boolean, a true and false. Uh, you can inject some JSON. Uh, here's the timestamp. So here are the whole, strew of things that you can inject. Um, I would assume that the, the let me admit these guys, um, your string number and probably timestamp are probably gonna be the ones that you, you use the most. And then your, your debug node here, I've learned this that you've got so you can debug just the message payload or you can come down here to the debug and say complete message object and that will give you a whole new slew of of debug messages that that you can take a look at so let's let's clear that by hitting the the, the trash button up here so let's inject aa0z again and you can see that it gave us quite a bit more stuff here. So it gave the message ID, it gave the payload, and it gave the topic, which is, there's nothing in the topic. So this can be very helpful whenever you're trying to like join messages or split messages, and each message has got a message ID, and you're trying to figure out, you know, how a message is being split or joined. Um, and then 
Dave, there's another trick that you showed me. I don't know if um, where you can um, um, you can um, um, uh, what I'm trying to say. That there's a certain amount of debug messages that show up in you. In yeah, you, 2,000 you characters. Now, yeah, 2,000 characters. You have to go in and modify the settings. Uh, uh, that uh, JS and, and increase that to 5,000. Uh, sometimes when you're looking at uh, data coming in, uh, the uh, the length of it will be uh, cut off, and you won't see all of the data. Yeah. Coming. So um, I, I've actually got something I want to show the guys, something basic yeah. to get going with an RT21 controller. How would you go about hooking up an RT21 to a Raspberry Pi and making it work as a rotor controller? Okay. Uh, something simple. I mean, it's how do you how do you start with it? How do you get the data in? How do you get the data out? You know, and how do you and this will be a perfect example of using the debug node. Okay. Do you want to set some base parameters for that? Is that a serial interface? It's a, the RT21 controller has serial and USB on it. Uh, my, okay. my model, it's a, it's, I just got it a week ago. I do not have the Wi-Fi model. So I'm USB uh, right from the controller right into the Pi. Okay, perfect. So you don't need any USB to serial adapters. So you want me to do that, Kyle? Yeah. I was just going to show the um, yeah, yeah let's uh, let's do that so um, let me get back stop because share I was going to I was going to show them how first of all to create you know the the nodes to communicate to it and uh, how to get the data in um, obviously you have to know the protocol uh, the parameters that you have to send to the rotor and then see the data coming back. And what do you do with the data that comes back? How do you get, you know, just the beam heading and not the whole string of data? So I was going to show them how to parse some data and then also create a dashboard node. Yep. Um, you want to. And then wanna... from there, go one step further to take an existing rotor flow and incorporate that into it to make it real fancy. Yeah, but... I gave you screen sharing ability. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. And yeah, I was going to show the, the dashboard and how to put something on the dashboard. No. Nope. Oh, you got my screen right now? Not yet. No. Why I am not seeing my screen. Oh. Got you a quick question there, guys? Yeah. Hey, I, I got that uh, that uh, node that I think Dave made or Alan made about the uh, ERC. I can get it to connect, but it doesn't stay connected to the ERC controller. Just throw throw that out there. I couldn't. It says it's connected, then it goes away, and it says it keeps saying waiting. What I, I got to check that out. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, let me drag this over to my other monitor so you're not looking at it. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll see like uh, echo, 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 echo. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, the ERC could be as simple as just. Uh, uh, is that a serial connection you're using? That's correct. I'm using a serial connection and I have the correct baud rate. And, um, and what's happening is it connects. It's, I see it connecting on the flow and then it says it, it comes back and then it says waiting. Right. And if you use either serial in, serial out or serial request node, uh, one of the things when you go in and set it up is you look at this default response timeout it defaults to 10 seconds. You got to make it down about 500 milliseconds. So that might be as simple as just changing that. If so, it's waiting, maybe yeah. the poll rate is not set up correctly. Yeah. Anyway, no, no, the, the, the baud rate was correct, but that millisecond stuff, that's perfect. Yeah. I no, the, play around with the millisecond. Yes, yeah, I, I, thank I, you, thank you. I, I, think, I think if it's the defaulting to 10 seconds, it will time out, so. Uh, try try changing it down to uh, start at 500 milliseconds. All right. So anyway, um, I have an RT21 controller. I have it plugged into my Raspberry Pi via the USB cable. And so I have a blank uh, flow here that we're going to work with. So uh, for the USB, uh, we're going to use uh, the USB uh, uh, 
uh, what you're called serial uh, serial request node for the USB. So uh, even though it's USB, it creates a serial port in uh, the Raspberry Pi. And uh, if I bring up my VNC viewer and uh, log on, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So anyway, if you go into folder, uh, I don't know how well you guys will see this here. That's better. You go into dev and then serial. When you plug in a serial device, uh, USB to serial uh, device or cable, uh, it'll create under DEV and then serial, it'll create a by ID or by path. So you open up the by ID folder and here's my cable. Uh, that's, the, that's what it recognizes the, uh, the RT21 controller as. It, RT21 uses an FTDI chip in it and every FTDI cable or device uh, has a unique serial number. Uh, it's unique to that. It's just like a MAC address on a computer. So what we want to do is we want to copy uh, the path because we're going to need that. So that's all we're done. Now we're done in our VNC viewer. Uh, now, um, on the uh, Groups IO website in the wiki, uh, Kyle was going through and how to get up and running with this stuff. In the wiki, there's step-by-step -step, uh, process on how to get up and running from having a blank uh, micro SD card in your hand to getting up and loaded with uh, .NET and Node-RED and everything on a Raspberry Pi. And part of that is loading in the VNC viewer and configuring it and also uh, PuTTY uh, for uh, Telnet access or SSA, should say SSH access. So we're going to use this serial request node, uh, which is over on the right, on the left here. I dragged it into the uh, into the middle here. This is our uh, workspace, and in order to set it up, I'm going to double click it. And if it's never been set up before, you'll be prompted to add a new serial port. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually delete this and uh, see. If we because I want to go through this and see how it says add new serial port. So I'm going to click on the little pencil here to edit it. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that, uh, we copied that by path. And when I'm right click, I'm going to hit paste. And there's the path that I copied uh, from the other folder for the uh, USB cable, uh, the, or the USB chip in the uh, RT21. Um, it uses DCU1 commands, which use 4800 baud, 8N and 1. Uh, all the DTR, RTS, CTS, DSR can stay at auto. And again, we got changes down to about 500. So now I'm going to hit add and I'm going to hit done. Now we have our USB in and out uh, to go in and out of the Raspberry Pi to the uh, rotor controller. So, so now. So Dave. Yeah. yeah. So how did you, what, what note is that? And how did you add that to your palette? Uh, serial request is there by default. Uh, that comes loaded with uh, with uh, Node Red. Okay. So it says Node Red Node Serial Port Serial Request. Okay. And so that's one of the default nodes that's loaded by you know in in uh, in the palette already. So we now have uh, this serial request that is should be talking to. Uh, the rotor. So what I'm going to do is the debug node, and debug is your friend always. And we want to see what's coming out from the rotor into uh, into the Pi. So I just wired it up, and I'm going to hit the debug up here and to see the debug messages. I'm going to go to current flow, and there's nothing in there. I'm going to hit deploy, confirm. And so right now, there's nothing um, from the rotor coming in. If I turn the rotor, let's see if we get anything. And uh, it's gonna start turning and it's not sending anything because the RT21 doesn't automatically report, but you, could, you can see that it is now connected. Uh, you got the green connected in the bottom left here. And so what I'm gonna do now is we need to send a command into the controller to interrogate the location of the rotor. So the RT21 uses DCU1 commands. And um, 
somewhere's in here, I had uh, the DCU1 commands, but I'd probably, uh, wherever it is, move this down the bottom. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I do have it someplace, but I know it's AP1 semicolon, and that will send, uh, if I take the inject node, as Kyle was talking about, I double click it, and I want to send a string, it's text. It's straight uh, regular uh, text that's sent in. So it's capital AP, one semicolon. And then we got to do uh, backslash R for return. And now I should be able to wire that up and deploy. And right now the inject node will not do anything until I click it. Because right now on the bottom here, uh, move this back up on top. Hold on a second. Uh, not here. Um, down the bottom here, it's you can have it inject after a certain period of time that the flow starts, and then you can have it repeat at an interval or interval between different times or at specific times. So for right now, we're not having it uh, send that command, but. If I hit AP1, then we got a message payload undefined. Uh, trying to figure out what I just did wrong. <laughs> um, and it is normal. It is normal to see this go to timeout um, in between. Uh, the command to turn the rotor is AP1, and then the beam heading. I'm at 304 right now, so I'm going to go to 290. Uh, semicolon, and um, I think you need a carriage return. And let's just see, yeah, I just I'm trying to remember the commands. Uh, DCU one commands. <laughs> um, this will get us the commands, but. It's AP1 and then the beam heading carriage return. Uh, AP, uh, it's, um, inquires the current bearing is AI1 uh, semicolon. I was wrong. So go back, we'll change this. You can actually use more than one inject node. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this and I'm going to set this to send a string of AI1 semicolon. Yeah, try it without the carriage return. All right. Yeah, because I think when you send it, it sends a carriage return. Yep. Yeah, so it's injecting it, and there you go. There's there you go. So, so AI1 is the uh, it, semicolon interrogates my beam heading right now. Now, if I take the carriage return out of here, and it's AP1, and then the beam heading semicolon, and every time you change it, you got to deploy. So now, if, uh, now what I'm going to do here is just to show you, you can set this for interval of every one second. So now what's going to happen is it's going to interrogate the RT21 every second, and it's going to show you 304 degrees coming back. And now if I hit AP1 20, uh, 290 semicolon, it's going to turn my controller. It should have turned the controller, and it didn't. It's, uh, oh, I know why. Um, instead of using the serial request, I want to use a serial in and a serial out. Sometimes the serial request will not function properly. So if I take a serial in, that's going to be from the rotor to the pi, which is message where we just want to see the data. And the serial out is going to be from the pi going to the rotor. And we just have to make sure now, since I've already set up that COM port, it's already there. It's the only COM port that's in my uh, pi right now. So it's already set up. Uh, you only have to set that up the one time. If you have multiple devices, you have to choose the correct device. So, 
And let's just make sure we're set at uh, 500 milliseconds. And the other one will automatically be set at 500 milliseconds as well. So we're getting the, uh, if I clear it, we're getting the 304. It should come back and echo it. I had this working before. <laughs> Um, and then the AP1, when you inject it, it should be sending it. Now, again, um, if you're not sure what it's sending, you can take a debug node and you could just connect it right here and say, what am I sending for message payload? We can hit deploy. And in order to turn off one of the debugs and leave the other one on, you just click the little window to the right of it. So if I click this, I'm sending AP1290 semicolon. And let's see, going to the properties here. Input on the character. See, it's sending a line feed. We want to return. Try that. I had this working, guys. I'm sorry, <laughs> Kyle. Um, I had this working, but um, so I. Whenever you send, I tell you what. Let me do this. Um, I'm going to do a different way, real quick. Okay. Because I have mine that's interfaced to uh, instead of going directly into the. Uh, rotor controller from the Pi. I have the Pi that talks to, uh, I have it talking to uh, PST rotator. I use some of the functionality in PST rotator so I can actually use that uh, as an example. So uh, for that, we can use a uh, UDP node, um, UDP in, and UDP out. So those of, those of you who don't know what PST Rotator is. Here. It is a program that runs on Windows, correct? Correct. It runs on Windows. Um, it has support for a whole bunch of different, um, whole bunch of different rotors. Uh, if you go into setup and you go into controllers, uh, you can see there, there's all kinds of controllers that it supports. Uh, you the trackers. It can track. Uh, different programming, uh, different programs. I have it set up to track uh, N3FJP logger. So when I put a call sign into the uh, call sign entry window, it will do a lookup on the beam heading and it'll turn the antenna automatically if I have it set up to do tracking. Uh, there's a manual and a tracking selection up here. Uh, gotcha. And then you can have it set up to do UDP communications in and out to the node red. And that's kind of what I do. So so what so what happens is the the PST rotator, your rotator is connected to Windows via serial or USB. You run that on Windows, and then Node Red sends UDP packets to PST rotator and communicates to the server that's running on Windows right. that way, right? Right. Now uh, over here. Um, uh, PST rotator for UDP uses 12,000 for the input uh, to to uh, to um, PST rotator, and it uses uh, have these reversed, and it uses 12,001 as the output. Uh, and that's in the documentation of PST rotator. So coming from PST rotator into my debug uh, is 12,001. When I send a command in, it's gonna be 12,000. So I'm just gonna hook up the AI1 command for right now and hit deploy. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna send it back in hex. So it's sending it as a buffer. We can change this to say string. 
And what's going to happen now is uh, I just change this to a string. All right, guys. Yep. So now you've seen target is 304. So that's that's where we're getting. That's where my rotor is sitting right now. And uh, oh, this is sending it to an IP address. Uh, UDP message. Listen for and two pound. Okay. I think that's on the input. Yeah, yep. you're. Yep. There and you go. My IP, the IP address would be my PC. Um, yep. So. And that's what it was missing. So now uh, I'm sending in an AI1 command and I'm getting back my azimuth uh, and the target. And PST Rotator with newer version has a, has a cool feature called target and azimuth. Target is your desired direction of the rotor and azimuth is the actual direction. But as you see, what's coming back is AZ uh, colon 304 or 303. Uh, what we want to display we don't want the AZ colon. So part of what we want to do now, now if I go ahead and I wire up this other node here just to be able to control it, if I set, put one for 290 and just to have another one go to um, AP1305 semicolon. Just so we can send it back and forth, but. So anyway, um, still didn't send it to 290. Um, hold on one second. I already have a whole flow for this written. So if you guys wanted to use um, your rotor controller with PST rotator, I already have one completely built uh, that already sends this. So um, it's already set up with the buttons and everything. And, and it's in, uh, the, the command is actually a PST rotator. Uh, where'd it go? Is right here. PST rotator uses different commands. So this is it right here. So that's what we got to send. And um, So um, going back, sorry guys, sorry, this is screwed up a little bit differently, but so for 305, I'm gonna send uh, 305. So it's PST and then azimuth 305 and then slash azimuth uh, and then slash PST. And same thing for 290. All right, so now, um, yep, there you go. So now it's turning. So now, um, we go and clear the garbage can. I just turned it to uh, to 290, and the query uh, for this easier okay, right here. There it is coming up as 290, as you see. So the um, commands are different with with the PST rotator, but as you see now, the target is 305 with the azimuth. As you see, is turning as it's updating now. So. The idea behind using PST rotator is when you get into uh, some of the advanced flows, uh, you can actually have a clickable azimuth map uh, that will show you in red the target uh, when you, you know, where it wants to go, and in green, the actual uh, position of the rotor as it's turning. So this is just a quick and dirty of communicating to PST rotator using a UDP in and out node. Um, and you could do the same thing with serial. Now, what do we do with that information coming back? And this is where I want to show a little bit of parsing, just some quick and dirty. So uh, we're interested in the 305. We're not interested in the AZ semicolon. So there's a couple of ways we can do that. 
um, I always like to use a function node. And in the function node, we take our message payload. That's always the information that's sent between one node and the next. It's called message payload. Um, and what we're going to do is say the message payload equals. And what we're going to do is um, the command is message payload dot S-U-B-S-T-R substring. And what we want to do is, if you look at it, it's one, two, three. It's the fourth character. And it starts at zero. So, so it would be three is the, is the fourth character. And we want it to go three digits in length. So it be comma three. So what this is going to do is it's going to sit there and take this as colon 305. It's going to say start at the three three digits long. So even if it's a, a, a heading of one, it's still going to try to take that three digits. And so it's going to take that, you finish off with a semicolon, and I'm going to hit return. And now what we're going to do is a little trick here is you can just take this and drag this right in between to where you get the dotted lines and it puts it in series. So we're going to deploy it. I'm going to hit confirm. And so now what we're going to do is you see we're getting the 305, but you see we're also getting that, th that colon 30 because TGA is longer than AZ. So we want to limit what's coming in. We want to only see uh, the message containing uh, AZ semicolon. So in order to do that, we can use uh, one of the nodes that you can load in is called string. Um, go and, uh, what Kyle was explaining with the message palette, it's uh, uh, it's like, right, node red contrib string. Yep. And that node there, um, that's is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that string node does a whole ton of stuff. Like yeah. if you want to re search and replace, if you want to concatenate, if you want to to cut off the last four digits, uh, the first four digits. If you go and, and now, take a look at the help file for well, what I'm do is instead of a string, I'm going to show them how to do a uh, uh, the split node. And uh, the split node might be a better choice and not the split. Oh, I'm stupid tonight. I'm not awake. Don't mind me. It's been a long day. Switch node. Switch, yeah. You want to limit what, what's coming right. out, right? So the, the switch node is pretty cool because what you can do is, like, say you want to get the azimuth information and the target information. You want both. So I want to say matches regex, meaning it contains this part in the, in the payload. And it could be a number. It could be a string, uh, an expression. Uh, so there, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to say if it contains AZ semicolon or, or colon rather, uh, okay, it's going to send it out output number one. And then what I'm going to do is say, okay, I'm going to add down here, add an item. I'm going to say if it matches regex and it contains TGA colon, send it out output two. Could you also use contains in there? Yes. You can use, I like to match regex because uh, it'll look for it any place in the payload. Um, so, and then there's also, there, there's a lot of different things. There's match regex, uh, there's equal, there's not equal, greater than, less than, greater than equal, less than equal, uh, has a key in between. Uh, you know, so if you have a, a, a payload and you want the, you want what's in between part, you know, part A and part B of the payload, you can use an in-between and just be able to cut out that middle piece. Um, it's true, false, and, you know, so not empty or not empty also. Not empty is pretty cool. Um, if you have a flow where you keep getting a uh, not a number when, it, when it's not sending information. So we're going to use the match regex for as and TGA, both of them with the, with the colon. Hit done. And now you see we have two outputs. So the first one is the as. We're going to send that up to the top. And then the second one is the TGA. And instead of just making a new uh, function node, I highlighted it. I hit Control-C, Control-V. 
and I just dropped it in. Now the TGA, we have to start because it's one letter extra, we have to start at the fourth character. Remember, it starts at zero. So TGA semicolon is, you know, the first four, that zero, one, two, three, we want to start at the fourth. So we're going to take that and we're going to wire that up to the second one. And we're going to wire that into another debug node. And I'm going to hit deploy. And so what will happen is you'll see I'll have 305 and 305 now. It's both of my payloads. If I shut off the bottom one, I clear it. Uh, it's just going to show me the azimuth. That's all that's coming in right now. If I shut off that one and clear it, turn the other one on, it's going to show me the target. There it is. So now um, if I take the rotor and I reach over and I turn it, it's going to go to 212 degrees. So you're going to see um, as it turns, you're going to see it updating. Now you didn't get to target because I commanded it from the front of the rotor. If I had commanded it from the uh, node red or, uh, or PST rotator, it would have had the TGA come up. So right now we're sitting at 211. And I'm going to hit uh, the inject and go back to 290, I think it is. And so now you're going to see uh, the 216 and the 290. The 290 is the target and then the actual rotor as it's turning. So what do we do with this information now? And this is where we get into the dashboard. And we want to be able to have this thing show up and display. So um, in my dashboard here, I got, I got all kinds of stuff here. Um, so don't mind me. If you notice, I have a couple of rotor flows here that I, I haven't disabled right now. But you can see right now, uh, the green is the actual beam heading. And uh, you can see it's tracking at two, you know, it's at 290. Uh, you know, and there's double stuff here because I actually have two flows that are enabled right now. Let me disable this one. All right. So, so this is my normal dashboard here, as you see, it, it's kind of uh, complicated, uh, but it's really not that. But so what you would see, uh, there, we have a rotor flow that's up on the group's IO group uh, that's already uh, made. And all you have to do is edit that rotor flow. Um, I'll show you the working one here. And let me let me just disable what we were working on right there. Everybody kind of understand, you know, what we did to get it in and out and get the information. So now with this payload, if I wanted to have the asthma show up on the display, uh, we could turn around and say, okay, I want uh, here's your dashboard nodes right here on the left, and I can either have it as a text box, or I can have it as a gauge. Uh, gauge is pretty cool. So you could drop the gauge in here and we could turn around, take the gauge and you have to assign it to a group. So for our demonstration, I'm just going to put it into here because I know where it's at. Uh, the type can be either compass, donut, gauge. I'm going to go with compass, right? Which is nice for a rotor. And it goes from zero and it goes to 360. And so, right, and uh, we can call it degrees if we want. So the units are degrees, zero to 360. Um, don't worry about the value format and uh, the label right now is gauge. I mean, we can call this one rotor uh, or azimuth, right? So it's azimuth. Hit done. And we're gonna take that, we're gonna connect it to the output of that function node. And that's going to get that number coming in the azimuth, which is at 290 right now. I'm going to hit deploy. And what I did is I assigned that to a group on my dashboard, uh, which is on another tab. Uh, Peter, do I need to feed Shadow or something? Yeah, uh, feed Shadow at the same time. Uh, um, hey, guys, if you're not, hey, someone's not on mute. Yeah. So, so anyway, so as you see, I just stuck it in here just so I could show you on the dashboard. 
Um, we can get into, Kyle can get into some of the customizing and the dashboard and stuff um, when we get into this. So this is just a quick and dirty uh, rotor um, connection to take the output and show it up on the dashboard and it shows you it's pointing at 290 degrees. And again, you could take now for the input here, uh, what we can do is let's just say we wanted to have uh, yeah. input. You wanna do a button? We could do some buttons. And what we'll do is we'll just do two buttons here. And we're gonna take what's in the inject, that command. And we're gonna copy this and drop it into the first button. Right? And uh, where we got payload. Yep. And if you notice the payload, again, different types, we want a string. And we're going to drop it in there. And this one, then we're going to label, we need a label on this. So we're going to call this one 305 for 305 degrees. And we're going to take the other one, do the same thing. Two ninety, and we're just going to wire both of those into the input. And I'm going to deploy it. But before I deploy it, now here's where you know the dashboard, the little arrow all the way to the right here. Uh, if you click that, you go down the dashboard, and I got a lot of stuff in mind. Don't pay attention to it. We're working with this home uh, WO2X shack control. That's the group where I, uh, I need to assign these. So I have to double click it. And up here, I have to assign it to that group. That's that on the bottom. That's why I picked that one, because it was at the bottom. Easy to find. I do a lot of development for a lot of different people. So I wind up with uh, all kinds of stuff. But as you see, they just appeared in that group now. So now let's just say I have I've been working on something with showing up all these different slice receive frequencies for the radio. Um, it's something I'm developing for somebody. So I want to take the azimuth. I want to put that down the bottom here. I just take it, left click it, and drag it. And then the 305 and the 290, I'm going to take the 290 and drag that up above the 305. And you could take these and drag them to different groups and stuff if you want. Uh, when you get into the dashboard, the first the, where it says home, that's the page of the dashboard. When you're in the dashboard, that's the whole page. And you can change pages in the upper left by clicking on the hamburger menu to three horizontal lines. And you have different pages here. So, um, so that's the page. And then in the page, you create a group, uh, which is that window, here, the little group here with all the stuff in the middle. And so you can create groups, you can add spaces. Uh, if you wanted to have a space in between the, the, the frequency and uh, the rotor control, uh, you can go into- uh, Yeah, go into the layout. Here. Yeah, go into the layout of the, uh, the, the, the homepage there. Yeah. Um, edit. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, layout, layout, sorry. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you, can, you can do it here and, and just drag the stuff also. Um, makes it a little easier to lay it out. Yeah, I like, I like that view because it's, it's more visual for me. Right. And when you create these groups, uh, there's defaults. The width of the group defaults to six. And the width of the page defaults to 48. So if I hit cancel and I come to the home here and I go to layout, you'll see this is the page. And uh, in, in Node Red, when you go into uh, the settings, or not the settings, but up here under site is where you set up your, your size of your page, your horizontal and vertical size of the page. And then the widget spacing uh, is six wide. Uh, and you can set up all of this here. And you can change it depending on the size of your monitor and the layout that you want. So, you know, just to keep it simple and get you guys started, uh, I put the azimuth here, uh, move the space up above azimuth, and then I have the azimuth, I have the 290 and the 305. I'm gonna hit deploy. And now, 
you'll see I now have two buttons here, 290 and 305. So if I click 305, it's going to send a command and there goes the rotor. And then likewise, if I click on 290, it's going to do the same thing. Now, if you notice the, the, the buttons are boring gray. Uh, <laughs> and if you look over here, my buttons are nice and rounded and colorful and stuff. Uh, I'm using what they call a UI template instead of a button. And uh, you can really start getting in. Uh, there's a lot of information. I did Google searches and learned how to kind of make things really nice and pretty and colorful and stuff. Uh, a matter of fact, um, different stuff to the text, the PGXL state. Uh, right now, uh, if I bring up the radio uh, and if I hit, uh, if I hit my, my tune button, uh, it's going to drop the amp to standby and I'll tune the key up right here. It says, you know, flex is transmitting and it put the, put the amp to standby when I did that. If I hit the MOX button, uh, it's going to, you'll see it's transmitting and the amplifier is transmitting. So uh, you can have uh, different color text and stuff. There's ways to do this. Uh, Allen WA9WUD has some terrific uh, flows that take advantage of changing button colors, uh, changing the uh, text colors uh, based on different events, uh, different values. If the bat, like here, if you notice my antenna genius in the middle, uh, I'm on the five band Yagi right now, so it's blue. Uh, if I switch to G5RV, which is available, which is green, the antenna is not available or in gray. So if I click on the G5RV, it'll switch to the G5RV and then the five band Yagi goes green, it's available. So that's some of the advanced stuff with uh, getting into dashboard customization. Uh, this is just a quick and dirty flow um, just to show you how to input stuff into uh, out, of, out of the Pi into a device and then out of the device back into the Pi. And then what do you do with it with the dashboard nodes? Uh, any questions? Now I'm going to disable this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back down and re-enable my regular rotor flow, which it already is actually enabled. So, and it, uh, so on the rotor flow, again, uh, what you can do on mine, on my rotor flow here, as you see, I have pre-programmed buttons here, which are UI, uh, what they call UI templates, but they act like buttons. And uh, I just did that for the color and everything. So I have pre-programmed buttons for different beam headings. I have stop that will send a command to stop the rotor. Uh, the manual and tracking allows me to either track the call sign when I entered into the logging program or manual will not have the rotor follow. Uh, this SVG graphics was written by Tormod, LA9BKA. Um, I think that's his call. Um, Tormod did a terrific job of, of implementing this where if you double click this, it is an SVG editor. If you click that, it allows you to put in an azimuth map. And I've found a, pro, a program called Great Circle Mapper that I'm able to create this map. And they have different types of maps that you can choose from. Uh, this one in particular I liked because it had all the colors for the different countries. And it allowed you to put in, erase the azimuth lines and, and the, uh, the lat long lines, I should say. And it allows you to put in the uh, country prefixes. So you can actually create a map centered on your location and uh, edit that. And so this is the same flow, except it's just got that extra in it. So this is already built. You guys don't have to even think about building this if you're gonna use PST rotator, it's already built. The only thing you would change is if you're not using a UDP connection, uh, or I, I should say, if you're not using uh, PST rotator, then the input and output, these two nodes here, this one, and this one, you would change them to the appropriate node, either a serial in and out, or, uh, or if it's a network rotor, uh, it could be a TCP request node uh, to communicate to the rotor. So 
<laughs> and what that does is on the on on the map here now, and again and again, in addition to having pre-programmed buttons that I can click on 280 and it goes to Hawaii, I can also uh, take it and I could just click someplace on the map. If I want to go to V6, I can click on V6 and it, you'll see the red. That's what I was talking about. That's the desired direction, and the green is the actual. And then what will happen is after 10 seconds, uh, that red will go away and it's just going to be green. So right now it's a red and green overlay. And then after 10 seconds, the red goes away and should turn to green. There you go. And so that's pretty much it. Kyle, you want to go on from here? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, any questions for Dave and all the stuff that he just showed us, which is great. No questions. I have too many sensor? questions. <laughs> well, st uh, yeah, start. So I, I saw that you have the antenna uh, genius and things like that. Have you worked with uh, the Elecraft um, uh, 500 watt uh, amp and the um, antenna switcher? on that or are there flows built for that? I have a flow for the Yellowcraft KPA 1500. I owned the 1500 before the Power Genius. And so I do have a flow for the 1500 that can be adapted. There's um, there's a flow out there for the KPA 500. And there, and there is one, there's a couple of people have written them yep. for the 500 that, that they do have them already made, uh, including the CAT 500. Okay, and there is also one that uh, does the um, antenna switch also? Yeah. Uh, well, that's flow the, for that? well, that's in the Cat 500, right? No, it's a separate. It's a separate module. Okay. Um, the if, um, if they Ale have, let me see. Uh, I'll look. Elecraft has a has an antenna switcher. Yeah, it's at. Uh, the, the 500 the only has one output port, oh, so you, it basically do a switch. Oh, you know, you the mean a tu the it? tuner? Uh, yeah, the tuner. Oh, the, K that's the Cat 500. Yeah, that's the Cat the 500. The KT 500, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying, the Cat 500. Yeah, there's yeah. a flow that, that's out there for the KPA 500 and the Cat 500 combo. Okay. Yep. I do have a question. Yes. Is there a uh, flow out there for the Pulsar HF Auto? Yes, there is. Uh, it uses uh, Terry's uh, W1TR's program. So it, uh, the, the, the Raspberry Pi would talk to the PC running the W1TR software. Uh, uh, Palstar has not let the protocol out for their tuner. Uh, Paul uh, threatened a lawsuit when I talked to him years ago about having the Palstar protocol built right into the Flex radio where you could plug it right into the back of the USB port on the radio uh, I tried to get Paul to sit down with Steve Hicks from Flex, and Paul threatened threatened a lawsuit. He says, "If you do that, I'm going to sue you." So, Paul is a very interesting character to deal with. Yeah, I'm on a waiting list for the, the Tuner Genius, so I just wondered if there was something in the intern. So there is right. just it's just the little intermediate program you have to run then. Yes, yes, that's the only way to be able to remote the HF Auto is to use the W1TR software. And if you use the W1TR software, there is a very well-written flow by Alan, WA9WUD, uh, for the HF Auto. And it gives you, you know, pretty much all kinds of controls. You can go to manual mode, you can go to bypass mode, you can go to auto mode. Uh, and you know you can initiate tune cycles and the whole nine yards. So that's on the group's I/O buried somewhere. Yeah, uh, it's. Um, let me see if I can find a link to it, uh, and I'll post a, a link to it. So, yeah, you, well, yeah the KAT five hundred flow that's out there, um, I think had uh, some some uh, hiccups in it, but I have it running and it it works excellently and works real well with my flex yeah i ran it for a while too and had some hiccups but then i think uh uh gary uh k6hn rewrote it and i think that it's good now i don't have it in my 
I took my KAT 500 out because I've, I've got tuned, tuned antennas, so I didn't need it anymore, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's good now. Yeah. Any flows for transverters? Uh, no, that I have not seen, but what do you want to do with the transverter? Is it relay control? Uh, it's a K5 signals, uh, multi-band transverter. Okay. And, uh, how, how are you looking to leverage node red with the transverter? Well, uh, since I've got the transverter port off of my flex 6,500, basically switch, uh, to the antennas on that. Um, yeah, so I would say with the transverters, the probably best thing to do is you uh, leverage the uh, the BCD data or or the bit data coming off the USB cable off the back of the radio when you set up the different bands in the tra uh, you know the transverter menu on the radio. Okay, I'm also looking at getting more advanced. I've got uh, beam and rope and a vertical that I want to switch either a vertical or a beam off of the transverter. So okay. that's looking yeah, to be that, a little bit more complex, obviously, but that's, yeah, that, I yeah, assume the, that's. What antenna switch are you looking to use? Uh, I've got some coaxial, I've got some um, 24 volt uh, relays or coaxial relays that I've got. Uh, so they're, they'd be actually relay driven. That's, I put in the chat the link for the uh, flows for the PAL star. Okay. Um, so if they're coaxial, just plain Jane relays, what you could do is you can come off the uh, either the uh, GPIO pins right off the Raspberry Pi and drive the relays that way, or use uh, another off the shelf relay, pro uh, relay product like the KM Tronics. Uh, they make a nice uh, land-based um, uh, uh, eight-port relay box that you can wire into your uh, relays for the antenna switching, and then write the flows that based on uh, frequency to say these relays are available. And then if you select relay one, it, it can lock out relay two and three or something. Okay. So you yep. can do actually interlocking between the relays. That KM Tronics relay is really slick. It's Ethernet based. Um, there's a couple of different flows out there for it and um, the support on those devices. It's not like a sane smart relay that you plug in the GPIO and things go haywire and you got to go get a new one. You call KM, KM Trotics up and they pretty much just send you a new one. No question to ask. I've got a couple of them and they are, I've had them for years and years and years and they are rock solid. Yeah, Mike Walker had a uh, an older version of the USB model, and um, it wasn't uh, fully compatible with uh, Node Red, and they sent him the newer model for free. Uh, they yeah. just exchanged it, no problem, and it was eight years old. So. Yeah, those guys are great. Well, land based, yeah, what you'd recommend? Uh, I would recommend the land based if you're going to go that way. Um, this way, you're not tethered to specific computer or Pi. Uh, you could put it any place on your network. Yep. As far as AC relays, uh, I use the Digital Logger Web Switch Pro. Um, I, I've been using that for years, and it has never given me one ounce of trouble. Not only do I have access from Node Red, but I also have access to another means as well, just in case the Node Red server decides to lock up. And I have the Node Red server plugged into it. I can turn that port on and you know that outlet on and off to restart Node Red. While this group has grown since the last time I was on the group's I/O, it was a little small group, and now it's turned into a whole big, people. Huge, huge, huge community. Yep, we got about 700 people now worldwide. I think we're just short of 700 or close to it. Let's take a look. Oh, huh. I had no idea. Yeah, members. Uh, we have. 698 members. I wonder who's going to be number 700. <laughs> Any other questions? What Pi do you recommend? It a, a 3B should be adequate for what you're doing with most of the stuff. Um, the cost difference between a 3B and a 4, 4 gig is not that much. Um, 
I'm using a four with four gig of ra uh, RAM. That's what I'm I got a, a Raspberry Pi 400. It's the keyboard and everything with all the adapters, HDMI cables, mouse for 70 bucks at Micro Center. Yeah, I seen that. Uh, I played with one up at the ARRL when I was working on their Node Red project up there. So uh, I actually, it looks pretty interesting. If you have an extra input on your monitors, uh, you know that that's that becomes a nice little box. What is a Raspberry Pi seven hundred? Four hundred. Four hundred. Yeah, it's a uh, it's keyboard and every you know it's pretty much keyboard everything built right into the unit. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So. Yep, I've seen them. Sorry, I just didn't yeah. know what they were called. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, uh, I'm not sure. I mean. Pi 3B and a Pi 4, I don't think they're that much in a cost difference. Yeah, I would, if you got a micro center or, or electronic shop, just go out and get you a Pi 4 with 4 gig of RAM and you'll be set. Yeah, if you're going to go with the 3B, go with the 3B plus. It's just a little faster. Um, you know, what you're going to be probably, what most people probably be doing uh, would probably work just fine uh, with the, like the Canna kit, which is a whole whole little kit with the power supply and a case and stuff, um, it's fifty five dollars for the three B plus, and uh, and if I go with the Pi four and the Canna kit uh, and the Pi four, depending on which kit you get, you know they 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 throw in extras with it, but um, you know the um, you know, you can get them. Uh, you don't have to buy the, the, the can of kit. It's just an all in one package if you want to make life simple. Um, but Micro Center is great. They have a really nice maker department. Uh, they carry all kinds of pies and Arduinos and accessories and cases and power supplies. And uh, I have one near me here and I, I love it. What was the name again? Uh, Micro Center. One word. Uh, Dash. Yeah, microcenter. Yeah, microcenter. dot com. Yeah. Um, where do you live? Uh, what, what? Where you at? Uh, Washington State. Let's see what we have. Ohio, Virginia. No, I don't see anything in Washington. Uh, but you might have. You know what you might have out there? Do you have a Fry's Electronics? Uh, we did. It closed. Oh. Okay. I think all the Fry's closed. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you can order on Micro Center online. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Micro Center, and also um, you could probably get a little bit better pricing for the exact same items on Amazon, and Amazon delivers all over. Some of yep. Micro Center's pie-related items can't be ordered on the web; they have to be picked up in the store. Just FYI. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's because they offer such good pricing. They want you to come in and pick up twelve or fifteen <laughs> other things. Yeah, we have a micro center by me, and and that's where I get all my pies. It's uh, I mean, you go to the back counter and say I want a pie, and they ask you which one, and they hand it to you, and you're done. Yeah, I, I'm in Columbus, the home of micro center. Oh yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you how I got a uh, an Nvidia 2080 Super video card for uh, four hundred dollars from them. <laughs> uh, I just had to buy a new video card, During and I about fell on the floor. During the height, during the height of the Bitcoin mining, um, I had ordered a uh, NVIDIA, I think it was a 2060, the real basic one. And I went, or it might have even been a 1660. And uh, it was like $400. And it was the last one they had. And I reserved it. And I, you know, they ask you for your credit card and everything. I go to pick it up. And um, somebody in the store sold it to one of their friends out from under me it was their reserve for me and somebody sold it so uh, i complained very loudly in front of people to the manager and uh, he says we'll give you the next model up at the same price well the only other card that they had higher than that model was a 2080 super which was a nine at the time 900 hundred dollar video card so <laughs> i lucked out yep yeah the pi uh the pi uh you can get the uh, the kit on uh, on Amazon probably cheaper, a little little bit cheaper than in uh, Micro Center. If you have a Micro Center near you, uh, obviously you can go and, and pick it up and have it in your hands uh, right away. 
but if you don't have one near you, then um, you know Amazon carries them as well. I have a question. It's not related to the the actual pie itself, but sure. on the PAL Star HF Auto, you, you talked about uh, Paul was pretty protective of the uh, command structure for that. Uh, I'm a little curious how Terry got rights to do that, but but the actual question I have is they also earlier had the AT Auto, which was a Kessler Engineering, right. and they all fell apart. And is there anything for the AT Auto, which is what I have? Um, no, but that uses standard Kenwood CAC commands uh, as far as following the radio. Okay. Uh, it uses standard Kenwood CAC commands, and there are commands that are documented in the manual um, for controlling uh, some of the other features in the. So that one shouldn't be any difficulty to no. set up by hand. No. no. Uh, you, can have, you can have it done one of two ways. If you, the AT Auto can be programmed. Uh, where you have either, it either has coax or balanced output. And what you could do is, uh, I believe that can be programmed uh, per band to select one or the other outputs. Uh, what I did is I removed the, uh, I removed the ballon from mine when I had it, and I put a second coax in. I soldered in a piece of RG8 off the relay and put another SO239 in the back of it. And so I had two coax outputs and I was able to program it where it automatically, when it went to a specific band, it selected either antenna one or antenna two. Ah. And then what I did is I just used a USB to a serial cable off the back of the flex. And uh, in the flex uh, USB uh, cable configuration guide, uh, there's uh, information. I actually wrote the procedure for it uh, with the setup that covers um, the cable, the pinouts, and the settings uh, to hook it up with the AT Auto. So you can have it plugged straight into the back of the radio, unless you want to be able to have control of it to switch antennas, uh, then you would want to feed it into the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can have the flex radio flow, get your transmit frequency, and then send that transmit frequency out another USB to serial cable back out into the tuner and it would it would track and follow it. Sounds great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got a question about uh, Mrs. Tyler about the uh, web power switch. Um, I'm seeing a couple versions and I don't know which one to pick. Uh, LP, LPC seven and LPC nine. I uh, have the web switch pro and um, Let's see if I can do this here. Hold and are they compatible, you know, with, with whatever flows are written? Um, here, I'll do this again. I, I think if, the I think the web switch pro is out of stock at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and I'm not sure if they have them on Amazon either. So I was just yeah. gonna check. Sometimes they have them in stock, but they're two hundred dollars. I didn't you pay, you know, 160 is the most you should be paying for one of those. Yeah, one there. I think they went up from 169 to 179. Oh, so I think they're I think they're 179 now, but um, they're, they're nice. Um, DLI, put a DLI in there. Yeah. And you're getting all kinds of stuff right in here. there. There it is. Oh, 299. So is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they got one star rating. <laughs> the dealer. Yeah, um, the LPC seven uh, DLI LPC seven, right? I don't know if they have it here or if they have it on their website. So, uh, products. All right, you have the Web Power Switch Pro and the 7. The only difference between the two is it doesn't have Wi-Fi. I'm plugged in Ethernet to mine, so the Wi-Fi is not a big deal. Uh, they both, uh, if you update the firmware, they both support um, various methods of talking to the devices. I use a, a programming language called Curl to talk to mine, and... Um, so if I go in and I go into my node red uh, right here, 
and this is this is my setting right here for my for my power switch. So and and what's nice about it is you can come into the power switch, and you can actually turn around and set up a custom uh, port. So you're not using web port, you know, web eight, uh, port 80, which is a web page or web server. So you can set up a custom port in there. Um, so this way, uh, if you want to access it remotely outside your network, outside of Node-RED, um, you can have it as a non-standard port. And then it's also password protected as well. So, um, but yeah, the, the, you know, then in, the, you know, so going back to, here, this is the flow I have for the Web Switch Pro, which will work with the seven as well. And it takes uh, curl commands here, sends it in, and then it, uh, you know, parses the relay state, and it gets the, you know, it takes the information and splits it into um, when it goes into sixteen, it actually sends it in uh, to ones and zeros. And if you go into split relays here, uh, this actually says, okay, what it does is it takes a numeric value and a numeric value might be, let's say um, seven. And that numeric value of seven would mean that relay one is on, relay two is on and relay three is on. So one, two and four equals seven. So the number that comes back is a number between zero and 255. So a combination of those numbers you see here, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128, those are the eight relays. And so it, what this does, this, this math here uh, on, on the back end is um, it actually sits there and it says, okay, it nibbles off and it says, okay, subtract the number, subtract the number, subtract the number. And it, and it uh, shows you which ones are on right now. I have relay one, two, four, five, seven, and eight are on right now. So if I go to my dashboard, you'll see them here, AC outlets over here, um, but we're right to the right of the rotor control. And I have PC RT21 controller, outlet three, 12 volts, node red server, outlet six, Radio PTT is not wired up, <laughs> so otherwise I'd be stuck in transmit. But so just clicking on them, and I used an icon uh, that you see changes between red and green uh, when it's on or off. So I have a positive indication. And it doesn't just change the icon, it actually gets the information back from the web switch and then reads the relay state and then sets the color of the node um, on the dashboard. So it gets a positive uh, that yes, it did turn off or it did turn on. So the seven and the nine, uh, the difference is the nine has Wi-Fi. Okay, that's good. I really appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. The seven sounds like the right the right unit to get. Something I can find it somewhere. Yeah, as I said, I just I guess the seven and. Uh, it says product update. Let's see, they, they replaced the seven with a nine. And um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't think you can get the seven anymore. You can yeah. only get the nine. Yeah, that's what I said. Product update. Yeah. yeah. So they, they replaced it with the nine. Uh, I don't know if anybody had any sevens left around, but if you go DLI factory direct or sold out for 179, but they get them in on a regular basis. What I would do is if you're interested, give them a call, find out what the back order is and Get on the list or something. But Would you recommend any other place to get it other than than digital loggers themselves? They actually sell on Amazon Direct. Uh, so when you you know there are other dealers on Amazon that have them as a markup, as you've seen. But digital loggers actually has a presence on Amazon, and they sell direct right through Amazon or right through digital loggers, and it's the same price. It's not a difference in price. I have not seen a dealer that's carrying them um, other than the ones that have them in, and mark them up. What's nice about it is you got eight switchable outputs remotely switch one, two, three, four, and on the bottom five, six, seven, eight. And then on the right, you have two always on outlets. So you have 10 outlets, uh, eight of them are switchable individually on and off. Uh, you can actually control it 
uh, from the buttons here if you want. Mine's actually mounted to the underside of my desk, so I don't even have access to it. And uh, it has a feature called auto ping, which is pretty cool. So let's say you have a cable modem and you have a router and your internet goes down. You can have this thing programmed to say, okay, I'm gonna, and the way I do mine is I have it programmed to ping MSN and Google every five minutes. And if I don't get a response from both sites three times in a row, which is a total of 15 minutes, it then says, okay, reboot the cable modem and reboot the router. And uh, I actually have those wired up, but I don't, I, I don't have them plugged into here right now. So uh, on my dashboard. It was like a watchdog circuit then. Yes. On my dashboard, that would be outlet three, which feeds uh, the cable modem and the router together. And uh, they just are not local to the web switch right now. So that's why I don't have them hooked up. But you can do that. You can have it set up as a watchdog that if your internet, for whatever reason, you can't ping MSN and, and Google or whatever site or sites, combination of sites that you want uh, after whatever number of tries and whatever time period that you set up in it, it will automatically say, okay, reboot these two outlets. And then it goes another 15 minutes trying to ping them. And then if it fails, it reboots them again. It just takes the outlets, turns them off, turns them on. And uh, so it's a pretty cool little feature. Uh, you can have control that you can turn the outlets on and off, or you can have it where uh, you can have it when you push the button, it uh, pretty much toggles the outlet. It just puts it, if it's off, it puts it on and then off real quick, or if it's on, it goes off and then on real quick. Um, so sometimes if, and, and then what they sell is a uh, AC relay. Um, uh, see if I can find one. these things here. Uh, they sell these AC relays. They, they, they plug into the 120 volt outlet. And it gives you a common normally open and normally close output. And it has a little circuit breaker built in and uh, has debounce protection on it, screw terminals with a little cover. So it's covered up. And uh, I have a couple of these. I have one that's connected to the remote on in the back of the flex. And the other one goes wired into the accessory connector for the PTT on the flex. Uh, when you set up SmartLink, uh, you need to provide either a PTT or a CW key closure. And so if you're remote and you want to change your SmartLink account, the only way you can accomplish that is by having a relay uh, across the PTT that you, when it says push the PTT, you close the relay. And then when it's done, you release the relay. So these things are pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure what they sell for now. When I bought them, they were $8.99 each, and I bought two of them at the time. Okay, so what these things do is you give them power, and it closes a relay on your behalf. Yeah, it, it pretty much is... A, you is can a, have a common open or common yeah, closed. Right. It's a single pole double throw relay with a 120-volt coil, but it's all in one nice little package. Okay. And, all right, good uh, work. Yeah, so, and, and again, what's nice about them, as I said, DLI uh, AC relay. Uh, what's nice about it, if you look at it, again, um, you can actually mount these. Uh, there's a way to mount them. Um, I think you can. If I remember correctly. Uh, Velcro. <laughs> I have mine Velcroed. But uh, they come in a little box, and they come with the pigtail power cable. And so you take the power cable and plug it into one side and plug it into the uh, Web Switch Pro. And uh, it gives you your common normally open or normally closed. And you can use that, you know, as needed. So if you, if you don't need a lot of dry closure or dry contact relays, uh, this is something, you know, right now there's somebody selling them for $20 each on, that, on eBay. But uh, when they're in stock at DLI, they're usually around $12, $13 now. And they, they make a lot of other products as well. Um, so not only the uh, not only the uh, AC relay, if you needed something to do 48 volts, 24 volts, or uh, you know 12 volt DC on a, on a, on a larger scale, uh, they have all kinds of products, and you know they 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 do all kinds of stuff. Um, you know three phase PDUs. I mean they have all kinds of 
nifty stuff if you've got a lot of money and want to spend it. <laughs> Any other questions? I say we need to do another session once we get a little bit more comfortable yeah, with this. Yeah, uh, what I would do is, is you know, get your pie, um, get loaded up with Node Red. Uh, as I said, on the groups IO, there's the, the wiki. Uh, if you like watching YouTube videos, Kyle has an excellent video on setting it up and uh, on his YouTube page and, um, you know, get started. And then I would recommend, you know, just start loading some flows and, you know, just open the nodes and see what's in them. Uh, just kind of see how they're connected together and and what they're doing and stuff. Um, if Net, you look, Node yeah. Red is like is like learning CW. You're not gonna you're not gonna learn it until you start doing it. Yeah. For example, if you look at my uh, you know the Vita forty nine flow here, this is listening to the UDP broadcast from the radio, and then I'm taking it. It comes in on a UD on a UDP listener node. And then I'm sitting there and saying, okay, split it on the, uh, you know, split it. Uh, so it comes up with different pieces. And I'm saying, okay, if it says carrot version equals, uh, send it out over here. And then it says, okay, and this is you know, saying, okay, you know, take it and extract the version of software. And I did a version of software version one, version two. And the reason being is flex changed the metering in the radio um, between versions. Uh, I And the way I wrote the flex radio flow for the meters is I didn't take the individual meter data and then put it into an array. I just parsed the individual meter data based on position that it came in. So it's a little, little bit more complicated the way I did it. Um, but again, so I just said, okay, if it was prior to version uh, 2.7 or prior you know, for version 2 or prior to version 2.3.2 uh, uh, if it's version 3 then it's a software version 1 as I call it. If it's uh, 2.7 to 2.99 or 3.2 uh, and higher it's software version 2 and I, the only reason I did that is because of the meters. Uh, then the model is pretty straightforward. Um, and, and it's pretty interesting. Based on the model, uh, there's different meters in the radio. The 6300, the 6500, the 6700, uh, they don't have a fan meter. There's no meter to monitor the fan speed. There's four fans in those model radios. There's two case fans, and there's two uh, fans, one on the CPU, one on the FPGA. And neither, none of those fans have internal metering to say, is the RPM of the fan, you know, is it working? Um, so the only way you know is when your radio starts locking up. Uh, the 64 and the 6600 uh, have a single 120 millimeter uh, fan in it. And they use baffles to direct the air to the CPU and the FPGA and the PA and, and, and you know, ventilate the, uh, the radio. And uh, it uses a three wire fan that they can monitor the RPM of the fan. So um, they do have an internal meter in the fan in the radio uh, that has the fan RPM. So if you notice here, uh, my fan speed right now is 1,076 RPMs. And um, so I wrote this that, you know, it depends if it's software version one or if it's software version two, and then what model of the radio it is. And then this, all this message B in, the message BPA, SWRT is temperature. Uh, this is for subscribing to the internal meters. And that's over here where it says flex meters, uh, you input voltage at the back of the radio, 14.4, PA voltage, 14.2, fan speed, and then the PA temperature, 30.6 Celsius. I could have converted it to Fahrenheit, but I left it at Celsius. Um, so those meters, the meter numbers change depending on the model of the radio and also if it's a, the, the software version in the radio. And so that's why I did that. Uh, it parses out the call sign. It says, okay, hey, uh, if I come over here and says, if it equals caret call sign equals, it gets the call sign and on the dashboard, 
you'll see up in the top here, it says in the upper left, it says radio call sign, WO2X. And uh, the in-use IP is nice because uh, right now I see my desktop's connected to the radio and the IP of my desktop. Uh, if I go ahead and I hit operate on the front of the radio, it's an M model, and uh, I hit run, uh, what will happen is you'll see now uh, it will show up here under client names and client IPs. Uh, it's going to show as soon as it connects. Um, it will show multiple clients connected. Uh, it'll show, uh, there you go. Uh, so desktop and then also the Flex 6600M, which is the front of the radio. And then the IP of the, the, the PC and the IP of the front of the radio, which is different than the radio IP. Uh, TXVFO, not a number. Um, that's because something I'm working on uh, for somebody else. I have my flow all kind of kinds of messed up. Normally, that would show you the transmit VFO. Uh, anyway, I do have another quick question. Yeah, sure. Is uh, now when you're outside your homeland, do you use a VPN to uh, go into this, or do you open the port up for the dashboard, or what would you do? Uh, the way I work uh, and use it is, and there's different ways. Um, I don't open, uh, I don't use a VPN. Uh, I don't use a VPN. I have a VPN set up. I don't use it. Uh, everything I do is done through uh, either Node-RED and, or I have what they call an out-of-band management uh, where um, I have specific stuff and, and that's uh, uh, set up and I use a, a service called Tailscale. Um, some of the guys are using uh, a service called Tailscale that it's an authentication server in the cloud and you set up Tailscale on your home computer or on the Pi and then uh, or you set up a Tailscale account and then you say my home computer is allowed to access this, uh, my Pi is allowed to access this and then you set up your your iPhone, your iPad, your laptop, and you can offer. I, I know what Tailscale is, so okay. that's what I've been using there. So it's a roundabout VPN that's easy to set up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we've been using it, and uh, it, it's really not a VPN per se. It's more of a, an auth authentication to limit what devices are allowed to access uh, devices in your network. Uh, and, and so, for example, I open up. Uh, and Kyle mentioned before that the uh, Node Red uses port 1880 when you're local, and uh, you know so when you're local to it, it's port 1880. But when I'm outside my network, I don't use port 1880. I I have it in my router forwarded to a different port, uh, another non-standard port. So uh, and then uh, this way, you know, people are scanning for, hey, is there any Node Red servers that I can hack into today? And they'll look for 1880 and start playing around. Yeah, that's oh, what I never was do that. Oh, no. <laughs> that's what I was getting at if there was a, a way to make it not outside of the WAN. So I got my own Oh, yeah. Well, if you, if, you don't, if you don't forward it in your router, it, it won't go outside of your local network. But if you, you want to access the dashboard from your phone when you're remote, uh, I would use a non-standard port. I would use a service similar to Tailscale or, or Tailscale to do authentication. And if you want to have an extra layer of protection, uh, Node Red can be password protected. So you can have password protection, uh, authentication, and a non standard port. You're going to say something, Kyle? I, I have seen in the forums that the HTTPS authentication with Node Red is a, is a little scary to set up and can be a little finicky. Yeah, Alan uh, WA9WUD has uh, set up a uh, tail scale on the Pi. And I think he has on, on the group's IO in the messages someplace, there's uh, there's probably a message uh, on how to set it up step by step. Uh, yeah. So if you look, if you do a search in the messages on the group's IO site, uh, just search for tail scale and you'll probably find what you're looking for. Yep. Hey, Kyle, you're going to be at the Hamfest Sunday. I'm going to try and be there. Yes. Kurt. Yes. I'll see you there. Have a good uh, and see you there. Maybe see uh, uh, Rick there too. Yeah. But and, yeah, and just to show you real quick, as I said, I have my Vita 49, which is getting the, the UDP broadcast package from the radio. 
Uh, and anytime you see one of these, uh, I usually put a, re a readme co a comment node here. You just double click it and it kind of tells you what to do to set it up. Uh, so in here, the only thing you got to really do uh, to set it up is this node down here is what they call a ping node. If you double click it, you just have to put in the IP address of the radio and you can change the name to the model of the radio you want. But what this will do is it'll ping the radio and uh, in my dashboard, uh, you'll see that I have a bunch of information under the flex radio panel here on the left. When I disconnect my client, uh, what will happen is you'll see that the client name, client IP, uh, BFO mode, all that stuff goes away. I know that there's no client connected at that point, but I still see the model and the call sign. That means that the radio is powered up and ready for a client to connect. If I were to power down the radio, that would go away as well. And that's done through this ping node here. So um, again, when it, the ping doesn't respond, it sets the message model and call sign to be blank. Otherwise, when, it, uh, when, when the ping is true that it's getting a response, uh, it doesn't do anything and uh, it allows it to parse the model and call sign from the UDP pro uh, message. Uh, my flex radio flow, what you see over here, this node uh, and, and the stuff to the, to the right is something I'm working on for somebody that wanted a way to be able to see the receive frequency of the radio. Well, it gets complicated, especially if you have a 6700 and you're running multiflex because your receive frequency could be uh, slice zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, depending on, on how you have things set up. At the same uh, time. Right, at the same time, or if somebody is running with, 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 with seven slices open and you connect into the same radio through multiflex and you bring up slice A, you're not on slice zero, you're on slice seven. So it, it becomes complicated. And that's something I was working on for, for a gentleman in Italy uh, that he wants to be able to take the receive frequency to select the proper beverage antenna. And so... Um, something wow. uh, something I'm trying to develop for him. And for him, it's going to be a single operator and not multiflex. So it becomes a little easier. So I was writing it to pretty much come into here and say, when the information comes in, if it says slice zero R frequency equals, and then it takes it and par parses it out. And if I connect in here uh, with my client again, uh, what will happen is, it shows you your frequency for slice A of 14206. And slice B right now I have up on 3844. So um, so that's pretty much uh, what I've been working on here. It just picks that off and, and, and gives you that information. Uh, the, the one thing I have to finish up on this is the message that comes in. And again, we were talking about the message payload um, just to show you. Um, you know, when you look at what comes out of the TC, uh, uh, when it comes out of the TCP request node, which is what's actually talking back and forth to the radio, uh, it converts it, this, this node here, hex to string, converts it into uh, text. And if I come into here and turn on debug for the current flow, um, you'll see it sends a lot of information in. You'll see this start coming up here. Uh, it's going to make a liar out of me. Anyway, it, it uh, normally would come up and show you a lot of information here uh, as it's connected. Um, as you see, you're getting just radio oscillator state and stuff like that. But if I were to change frequencies, you'll see it gets a bunch of information here. It shows you your RF frequency. Now that's your receive frequency. Uh, and then it, is, it, is it in wide mode? In other words, are your bandpass filters disabled? No, wide equals zero. Um, TX client uh, handle, uh, the state is ready, meaning it's in receive. Uh, and, and just gives you all kinds of information here that you can parse out and do all kinds of, here's your transmit frequency. Um, I'm actually parsing the transmit frequency over here differently, where it says, if, you know, freak equals uh, with, the, with this coming over here, it comes into here and says, okay, Take starting at the six character again, zero through zero through five, 
six characters, seven characters long, that's my frequency, it puts it to fixed six decimal places and then sends it out to TXVFO to my dashboard. So uh, my dashboard, you'll see over here the frequency 14, 213, 300. So this is just something that I've been working on and it's, it's always growing and stuff. I have a flow for the Power Genius amplifier um, where I can pull off all the different information. Uh, the Tuner Genius and then the rotor control, which we saw before, the Antenna Genius. The Antenna Genius is pretty cool. Uh, it actually interrogates the Antenna Genius and pulls, it's where it says set antenna name, it actually pulls the Antenna Genius and pulls the antenna names from what's programmed in the Antenna Genius. So it's on my dashboard are the names that are programmed in the Antenna Genius when I set it up. And you see, I only have three antennas. That's all I have here. but the other ones I have are grayed out. I have them, if you look at it down the bottom left here, uh, it's disabled. So I disabled ones that I'm not using. And then I did not put the other ones in here. So this is actually, the first group is eight. The next group is another eight for 16. And you could double this up and actually have this be a two by 32 antenna switch. So it's capable of doing two by 32. And then uh, the DLI web switch, and then these other nodes here are uh, just uh, all uh, FR stack stuff that I have. Uh, the speech node is pretty cool uh, that I've been working on. Um, something that uh, a uh, sight impaired ham decided that uh, would be pretty cool. And if I enable it, and I probably USB fourteen point two one three three zero zero. It's coming. Man. 14.213300. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we got it. Yep. USB. <laughs> so, so, okay, I picked it up from my headset so you can hear it. So, uh, so it pretty much uh, set up that I can start setting up different commands and everything. And uh, anything that I have set up in Node Red, I can tie into that. And when the chain, when the state of those, uh, whether it's the mode, whether it's the frequency, uh, you know, anything I could set it up for the for the switch for power on and off. Uh, I could tie into that and be able to have a sight impaired ham uh, be able to have access to this. And for the sight impaired hams, uh, there there's an item called the stream deck uh, that they've been tying into Node Red and into FR Stack, um, and also. Um, uh, not only the stream deck, I got my stream deck here. Hold on. Uh, you know, the cable's probably not long enough, but anyway. Uh, stream deck was the first thing I brought for my flex best investment yep. ever. Yeah, yeah, I have that. And I've been playing around with it, a Genovation keypad. We use those in the 911 center where I worked. And the Genovation keypad uh, is a, they make different models. And the one I was playing with had, had a serial connection on it, had a serial port. And I plugged it into a serial port and it's a 24 button keypad and they make keycaps that you can double up if you want a bigger button and stuff uh, like for a PTT button and you can program it up. And I had it programmed up uh, where the 24th button was like a shift button. So you wound up with 23 buttons and if you hit the shift button, you had another 23. So you had 46 buttons and you could program it up and I just programmed it to send one through 46 into node red and then once it said okay you know button number 12 okay what do i want to do with it i want button number 12 to set the radio to um, um uh, your 14, favorite net, net frequency exactly uh you know it sets to the favorite net frequency the mode everything it just sends that macro right to uh right to the radio you know, it could turn your amplifier on and off operate standby whatever you want to do so um, yeah, the Genovations are, are not as popular anymore, but uh, you could still find them out there at a reasonable price. Dave, can you show me how you uh, made your buttons round with the template? Yeah. All right. So, can uh, you also tell us what Vita 49 stands for? Uh, Vita 49 is a protocol. Uh, what it stands for 
Well, uh, well, where does it come from? I, I don't recognize it. I mean, I know what FR stack is. I know what all the others are. But when I see Vita 49, I'm like, what's it's that? It's a packet-based protocol, protocol to convey digitized signal data and metadata. <laughs> Okay. So it's not developed by Flux. It's uh, Vita.com. It's 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 an industry standard. Is it more uh, like a library to make things work? Not so much a library, but it, it's just like a, a protocol. It's an industry standard protocol is what they defined it as. Okay. I, I can and pursue it, it from there. I, I just yeah. did, actually did not know what it was. Yeah. So Vita 49, software radios, evolving language. Uh, so there you go. So there's you know, plenty of articles on it. Uh, and uh, what's nice about the Vita 49 is that it, you can actually stream uh, the audio, like the DAX audio is streamed over Vita, Vita 49 packets. Um, so when the audio comes out of the radio and it goes to, uh, to your computer and from the computer, then it goes into WSJTX over the network, it's, it's actually Vita 49 format uh, protocol. Ah, very good. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really a protocol more than anything. Like, uh, you know, RTP is a protocol for voice over ITP, or voice over IP, I should say. So um, you wanted to see the buttons. So Yeah, just real quick. We got, yeah. uh, I know it's getting late. It's uh, 951 right. where so I am. Here, I'm going to turn into a pumpkin here yeah. soon. Over here, what I've done is this CSS node. Um, this sets my CSS for the page or for the, I should say for the, uh, you know, for the group. So you drag in the CSS node okay. and I actually have a page in the back here. Uh, I have all kinds of stuff that I kind of keep my back pocket examples that I find and I say, oh, this is pretty cool to keep a hold of. Um, but there's, there's one here I have that has the CSS uh, information on it. And um, ICOM 9700, Ooh, look at that. There's, uh, also, it's gonna be interesting to see what type of information comes out of the K4. Yeah, here it is, the CSS stuff right here. So this, this is something I found online. And again, the CSS is what you would, copy this node and just drop it into flow someplace it doesn't have to be connected to anything and then you have different buttons um you know you have red uh so if i enable this if i go into here and i enable this page you find that on github uh no google search okay so now if i go to my dashboard I don't even know where I put it. There you go. So these give you all kinds of different, that, that's that, just that stuff there. Uh, yeah. Gives you these examples of the buttons. Um, so you have red, green, blue, and then the size also, and then the greenish, orange, and then the, you know, the smaller buttons as well. Right. And so, you know, and again, you look at the red, and then what you have here is, you said the you know MD dash button class and it says vibrate filled touch. So when you when you when you when you click on it, it actually kind of vibrates the button. Ah. It actually allows it to have a little bit of a an effect to it. Yeah. Uh, the style it says background color and you set your you know your your background color here. Uh, and then when you click, what do you want to do? Okay, it sends hello world. Um, yeah. And then. So, and again, uh, you know, it just, and then this would be the name on the button. And then this would be the second row for the name. So it says red button. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It says red button. Right, right. And, uh, and that's pretty much. Okay, pretty much gotcha. Um, so what I did in the rotor flow, for example, is uh, under here, same thing and vibrate, you know, so, and it goes background color and I set the background color to that blue color. Yep. And, uh, you know, it sends the, you know, PST rotator command to set it to 50 degrees. But and then you've got buttons that change color with the state, right? You can do that also. So what you can do is you can set uh, where you have the, uh, the button, uh, you know, where it says uh, the background color. Yeah. You can actually use the, uh, you know, the, 
double bracket and you can put in like you know message dot color or something in there. Oh yeah, yeah. The the and, mustache. And it, yeah. So you do the double mustache and, and do uh you know, then close it with the double mustache. Yeah. And you can do okay. like message dot color. And if you look at the buttons uh on the input, you have an input note, you know, you have an input here and you can actually feed the color yep. based on the state. So if yep. you if you interrogate your uh, your relays and the relay is open and you want it to be gray, uh, you can set message dot you know message dot color you know gray, uh, and then if it's if it's if it's closed, you can have it blue or something. Right, and right, right, right. Okay. So, All right. Yeah, it's just a way you can control it, and then the yep. manual and the tracking uh, again the same thing uh, you know, uh, and in here with the. Uh, uh, these aren't wired in right now. Um, in this in this flow, the other flow I have, they're wired in. Uh, but what they do is, I don't have it wired in. In other words, when I click it, what it does is it sends a payload off to the as stop, and then the as stop is what actually sends the command. I didn't put the command into the button. I could have built it straight into the button if I wanted to. I didn't. Um, the reason I didn't do that is because somebody else might be using something and they don't want to use the UI template node. They may want to use a button node. And so that's why I left the as stop and the as track here. Yep. All right. Any more questions coming up here on two hours? Yeah. And that's been a long night. Yeah. Well, it's been productive. Well, I really least. appreciate what you all have done. And, um, I look forward to any other seminars you might have. And uh, of course I'm subscribed. Yeah, to the forum I, I, and... I think probably what I would suggest you guys do is for the guys that have not uh, done anything yet and are looking to do something. Um, and I think Kyle agrees, you know, get, you know, either a pie, you can load it on windows to play around. The problem with running it on windows is that you have to start it from a command prompt. And you have to leave that window open and it's very easy to inadvertently close the window and then your server stops running. So, you know, you know, it, you can do that to play around and get started. You don't have to have a pie. You can load, you know, you can load node red on your windows computer just to get started and start dabbling and, and playing around. Um, on the groups IO site, uh, there, there's plenty of flows that you can load in to see what people have been doing. Uh, how they're accomplishing different things, uh, both with the flex and with other equipment, relays, uh, uh, amplifiers, tuners, uh, you know, antenna switches and watt meters and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, Elecraft W2 watt meter is supported. Um, I think the wave node, um, I think there was another one that they did that we supported too that, that that's written. But yeah, yeah. there's, yeah, yeah there's, there's a bunch. There's, yeah. So, like Dave said, the, the the best way to get into this is to 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 get your hands dirty, load it on a pie, and start loading flows, and just clicking on the flows and just seeing how they they they, they interact and how and put a like Dave said before, your best friend is the the debug node. Now, if you, yeah, I was going to say yeah, the debug node. Now I just want to show one more thing, Kyle, real yeah, quick. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we'll get back into. Uh, share my screen again. One more thing I just want to show for these guys is um, let's say you have stuff that's built and you uh, don't want to risk losing it. Uh, what you can do is on the hamburger menu in the upper right, uh, you can go export and you can export your current flow as a, and you would select JSON and then download and it would copy it to your download folder. You can also export all of your flows as one single file. So if you just wanted to have a backup of what you have on your Pi, you could do an export all flows as a JSON and hit download and it would download it. And now I have all my flows downloaded in, you know, you know, in case something happens and I have to wipe it out. The other thing is there's a, a in version, uh, in the newer versions of Node-RED is you have projects. Um, and what you can do is if you want to experiment and you, you have a, a node red server running uh, and you don't want, you know, you want to have your, your stuff intact, but you want to play around and do a demonstration or you want to play with something new, uh, you can come under projects and go new. Give, and then you hit continue. Uh, you give it a name and say, uh, 
new project or whatever you want to call it. And um, oh, it doesn't like spaces, sorry. New project, create project. And what it's going to do is it's going to give you a clean slate. Now, all those extra nodes that you may have imported will still be there, but you now have a clean slate that you can play around without risking screwing something up that's already working. And then once you get everything up and working, you're, you're, you're tweaking things, you're building things or whatever you're doing, and you get it to the point where you like it, you can then go ahead and export it, save that file, and then go to your projects and go to open, open your main project, and now you're going to be back up and running with your main project and that work that you just did, you can then import that in. So that's just a way of being able to export and import and, and also have a, uh, have a, a way of playing with things without risking uh, messing something up that's already working. So Yeah, very cool. Yep. Right. Dave just went around the world there. Yeah. It's it, it, and the, the great thing about the if you haven't, obviously, everyone's probably signed up for the group, but well, I don't know, maybe some of you got in from uh, the, the remote um, uh, Facebook page that there is yet to I have yet to to post a question and it doesn't get a response or it doesn't, you know, get some type of, of discussion. The group's I.O group is awesome it's uh dave and alan and mike and other people contribute uh when they can and it's it's an awesome group it's uh uh even if you're trying to get started there's a lot of stuff there we can get you started even if you're advanced uh and uh, got some hard questions there's some people in there that uh, can probably help you so there's, um, there's no there's no dumb questions but yeah so. and also if if you don't get a response, you know, in a timely fashion from our group's IO, Node Red has got a whole discussion board that you can go out and I've asked questions out there on the Node Red discussions. And those are the super, I mean, those are the guys that literally program 24 seven in Node Red. So those um, guys really are sharp. Yeah. So you'll probably get uh, an answer. And um, another, another resource is uh, Reddit. Uh, there's a Node Red group on Reddit. Oh, yeah, yeah. As well. Yep. So. Nope. All right. Any departing questions, thoughts? Quick question. You said uh, Facebook remote is what's the name of that group? My, uh, Dave, oh, the remote, what is that uh, one? Uh, Hang on. Radio, uh, uh, HF remote. Yeah. HF Mike, remote. Okay. Mike just created it. It is, um, man. Well, I think most of us are going into this because we have situations where we need remote. So that's, I think that could it be is interesting. Ham radio dash remote HF station building. How about that for a name? That's a long one. Okay. I can find that. Thank you. Yep. Yep. All right. I'm going to, yep. Thanks. I'm going to stop Thanks. the recording here. I don't even know how to stop this recording. Oh, stop it. There.